Welcome back! As you may know, this Sunday marks the 100-year anniversary of the Titanic disaster, and it's been 27 years since the remains of the luxury liner were discovered at the bottom of the Atlantic. But recently, a team led by Amazon founder and CEO Jeff Bezos made its own awesome discovery at the bottom of the Atlantic. Five engines from the Apollo 11 Saturn V rocket that took humans to the moon for the first time. Using what Bezos described as state-of-the-art deep-sea sonar, the team found the engines 4.25 kilometers below the surface, where they've been since shortly after the Apollo 11 mission lifted off in July of 1969. Bezos said they're currently making plans to raise at least one of the engines, which will be quite an undertaking given that each one intact weighs about nine tons. These engines only operated for about 150 seconds, during which each one generated an astounding 6.8 million newtons of thrust to lift the Saturn V. As they did, each engine burned through about 27 100 kilograms of kerosene and liquid oxygen per second. And two and a half minutes later, they burned through their fuel, and the first stage of the rocket fell, as planned, into the Atlantic Ocean. Bezos, a lifelong space fanatic, privately funded the mission to find and salvage these historic pieces of machinery, and NASA says they wish him luck, which isn't surprising since NASA retains ownership of any artifact that's recovered. So Bezos is basically doing the hard work for them. If he brings up any engines, NASA has tentatively agreed to put one on display at the National Air and Space Museum, while the second would go to the Museum of Flight in Bezos' hometown of Seattle. But what would happen if they were able to salvage more than two? Well, let us know in the comments where you would put one of these amazing pieces of machinery on display, and we'll update you as the mission continues. Another anniversary is coming up that has us studying the deep sea. It'll be two years next week since the Deepwater Horizon oil rig started barfing out more than 605 million liters of oil into the Gulf of Mexico. And a whole slate of new research is showing us how severe its impact has been. The first comes from a team of more than a dozen American scientists from all kinds of different fields who went on an emergency expedition to the bottom of the Gulf in the fall of 2010, months after the well was capped. Using some pretty awesome equipment that you might have heard of, like the Navy's Alvin Submersible and the remote vehicle Jason 2, the team studied corals on the seabed some 11 kilometers from the well and found what they called widespread signs of stress, like tissue loss, loss of mucus secretions, and layers of brown goo called flock that was found to contain petroleum. About a quarter of the corals studied were more than 90% damaged, and another quarter were impacted by at least a half. Coral colonies can live for hundreds and sometimes thousands of years, so the effects of this damage will be felt for a long time. Another group of scientists has announced that they found oil from the Deepwater Horizon well in zooplankton, the tiny animals that are the food supply for fish and shrimp, in random patches around the northern gulf, and even in new patches of it after the well was capped. So this means that the oil is now officially in the food chain, and that is my food chain, and I like fish! So oh, I'm not okay with that. And of course, let's not forget the dolphins. Marine biologists from NOAA announced just days ago that dozens of bottlenose dolphins examined last year off the coast of Louisiana, which got some of the worst of the spill, were found to be suffering from all sorts of health problems, including weight loss, anemia, low blood sugar, liver and lung disease, and abnormally low hormone levels. NOAA says that the incidence of dolphin strandings when they get beached or stuck in shallow water have more than quadrupled since the spill. Most of the stranded dolphins have been found dead, so on April 1st, NOAA declared an unusual mortality event, which is basically like a state of emergency for marine mammals. It all makes me want to never drive my car again, but I can't seem to stop. Okay, but not everything is our fault, right? Like, natural disasters, it's nice to think that some of them might still be natural. Like earthquakes, right? Alas. Turns out, we've Actually, you know, the human race has been creating earthquakes for quite some time. Redistributing a large amount of weight on the surface of the Earth by, for example, creating a massive reservoir behind the Hoover Dam can cause earthquakes. The same can happen when we try to get rid of our wastewater by injecting it deep into the Earth. Since 2001, a six-fold increase in earthquake activity has hit the central United States. The U.S. Geological Survey has found that this increase is almost certainly man-made, caused by the removal of natural gas from the Earth. The study, however, did say that hydraulic fracturing or fracking was not to blame and that this kind of exploration was not responsible for any earthquakes that cause significant damage. The mechanism that causes these earthquakes is unknown, but the sort of idea is that natural gas is sitting in the earth and it's in a, like a pressurized cavity, basically. And as you extract that, that pressure decreases and things shift and you get earthquakes. Geologists think that whatever is causing the earthquakes, it couldn't cause 
earthquakes of dangerous magnitude. So I'm glad that they think so. I'd prefer that they know so. So I guess the only thing left that we can't blame ourselves for is volcanoes and solar flares. For now, anyway. See if we can manage to mess that up somehow as well. Seriously though, for now, most natural disasters remain mostly natural, but the continuous inputs from humanity into the Earth's systems are significant, and we and our descendants are going to have to deal with the results of that. To wit, earlier this week, marine biologists in California said that they've found radioactive iodine-131 in kelp beds along the coast of Southern California just a month after last year's nuclear meltdown at Japan's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. They described the levels of contamination as significant, although likely non-harmful, at least to people. But they said that the contamination may affect the fish that eat the kelp. But then what if I eat the fish? Finally, another week, another scientific controversy. This one about bees. You've heard by now about the rapid disappearance of honeybees in the past six years, a phenomenon known as colony collapse disorder, where bees abandon their hives. Well, a team of Harvard biologists is attributing the collapse to something that people love to hate, high fructose corn syrup. Commercial beekeepers feed corn syrup to their bees, and the new study suggests that by eating it, bees are being exposed to a special insecticide that's used on corn. The research shows that when 16 hives were exposed to different levels of the insecticide, the bees didn't just drop dead. In all but one of the hives, the bees abandoned their colonies just as they do when a colony collapses. But then, of course, the company that makes the insecticide, Bayer, says that the study sample was too small, it used concentrations of the insecticide that were too high, and it ignored other factors that could contribute to collapse, like disease and parasites. I don't know who's right here, though I do know that there are a lot of people hating on corn and anything made from it. But I can also tell you that I, as a person, like to eat. And since bees pollinate about a third of our food crops, they better figure this out and fast. Thank you for watching this episode of SciShow News. If you have any questions or suggestions for things that we should be covering, please leave them in the comments below or on Facebook or Twitter, and we'll see you next time.